Now, you guys apparently missed the benefits of hearing me as a younger man because <laughs> I used to pride myself on a chapter or two or three chapters uh, a sermon. However, one thing that you do benefit from is for far shorter sermons. So that is a good thing. <laughs> we go slower, but we go faster. How interesting. Second Thessalonians chapter three is where we have come to today. The Apostle Paul, writing to this precious congregation with whom he had spent only a short time, and yet you can tell by the tenor of his letter, both this one and the previous letter to the Thessalonians, that he is beloved to them, they are beloved to him. And they're going through some tough times. Attacks from without, turmoil from within. Similar to what we were saying all that time through the Philippian letter. Not much has changed in the last 2,000 years. We have attacks from without, sometimes not as bad as being dragged out of our homes as Jason was in Thessalonica. But at the same time, Satan doesn't rest. We, we may live in a, uh, a, a land of liberty, but when it comes to the spiritual battles, I hope we haven't fallen asleep there. There is an active spiritual battle. Satan, like a roaring lion, just as he was in the days of Peter, and Peter knew well the sifting of Satan, and he could speak to that and say, hey, you watch out. Satan attacked me, he got me. But you be careful, he, he's still on the prowl like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So even while the exterior may seem peaceful, I hope Christians understand, I hope we know that we are ever on the battlefield. So we, we still have attacks coming against us. And at times, uh, far too often, I'm sure, uh, turmoil from within. Things that bog down the body of Christ, things that get in the way, conflict within the body. So Paul tells these people who face the world as we yet do, finally, brethren, pray for us. Now, Paul understands they need prayer, but he reminds them that as he is on battlefields and other places, that he and Silas and Timothy, hey, we need prayer too. So even though you might be under attack, even though there might be trials in your life and within your congregation, let that not be an excuse to pray for others. Pray for us, he says, that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. And he'll get more into some commandments in the following passages of chapter 3. We'll look at those next time. But here, another benediction. We looked at a benediction at the end of chapter 2 last week. We'll see a benediction at the end of our study in verse 16. But here, Paul once again, I'm not sure how many letters where he has multiple benedictions. Just he stops for a moment. Now may the, the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. So much here in these brief verses. Any of you who have studied the letters of Paul, such a, a dense and eloquent writer. He can say the shortest sentences, and yet we can spend sermon after sermon unpacking each clause, sometimes even each word. And so he speaks to these people, and he reminds them we need prayer as well. And so I think that's a good place for us to stop and remind ourselves. It's wonderful to ask people, hey, pray for me, I'm going through something. But let us never be so self-conscious. Let, let us never be so self-absorbed that we don't realize, hey, 
someone else needs prayer as well. The world doesn't revolve around me. So as you pray, as you ask others rather to pray for you, be on the lookout that you are praying for others. I, I think this reminder from Paul is such a, an excellent thing to remind us of today. Let us engage with ever more vigor and fervor and passion in our prayer lives. And let's allow our prayer lives to go back and forth between those that we love, between our fellow Christians. Hey, would you pray for me? I have a decision to make. Hey, would you pray for me? I'm going through a trial, and boy, is it just taxing me. I'm full of anxiety and worry over these things. Please pray for me. And is there anything that I can pray about for you? Let us always make sure that our Christian brothers and sisters, that they know that we are not self-absorbed, that we love people to pray for us, but we want to pray for others. Let our prayer life be balanced. Let us spend time in prayer, as Jesus taught us, in worship of the Lord. Father, hallowed be your name. Let us spend time in his presence, blessing his name, thanking him, giving honor to him, basking in his glory. Let, let us sit in prayer and hear from the Lord through his word. Let us hush ourselves from the trials, from the temptations, from the anxieties, from the worry. Say, Lord, would you speak to me from your word? Let us read the word and let us be silent in the presence of the Spirit. As we read the word, let us pause, let us stop, let us meditate. And let us take it in. Let us mull it over. Let us contemplate its truth. And ask the Lord to speak to us through his word. Do we believe that this is living and powerful? That it is sharper than any two-edged sword? But are we fearful on pointing it inward? Let us worship the Lord. Let us praise the Lord. But let us hear from the Lord. That's balancing the prayer life. Uh, Lord, I need this. Lord, you know what I'm going through and I need your strength. Lord, would you please help me? Lord, I pray for my son or my daughter, or my grandchild, my niece, my nephew. I, I pray for this thing that's going on at work. Lord, I, I pray for my wife. Lord, I pray for this. Lord, now I'm going to shut up. I'm going to have your word open in front of me. I'm going to read a few words. And Lord, would you now speak to me? Lord, let me be silent in your presence. It is so difficult, perhaps more difficult for modern Westerners than it was for ancient people. But I think for people of all times, it's difficult just to shut up, just to stop, just to be still and wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Hear from the Lord. Seek the Lord in silence. See what he might say to us. The Lord still speaks. The Lord still wants to comfort you. I, I think we are used to our prayer life being, Lord, I need your comfort, and off we go into worry. Instead of, Lord, I need your comfort and I will be still in your presence so that you might comfort me. We, we wonder why we're not at peace, right? Because we're wanting all over the place. And Jesus has tried to tell us, I quote the verse so often, the peace I give isn't the kind of peace the world gives. Can you pray with me one hour? I think Jesus still asks us this. The Spirit is willing. Your spirit, if you are born again, your spirit is willing. Your spirit wants it and needs it, cries out after it. Oh, but the flesh, the flesh is so weak. We busy ourselves or we just fall asleep. And Jesus is still calling us into the garden. And it's not necessarily a garden of peace. Gethsemane was not a garden of peace. 
When Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, did he look like he was at peace? The Bible speaks of his agony in the garden, praying until sweat began to drip as if it was drops of blood. And yet, where did Jesus end up in the garden? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then he could stand before his friend and betrayer, Judas. And then he could reach out to Peter and put the sword away. And then he could heal the ear of Malchus. And then he could stand before Herod. He could stand before Pilate. And he could take the cross. And he could say, now that all things are finished, it is finished. Gethsemane was a place of agony and, and passion and difficulty and trial, even in the prayer. And yet that's where he found peace. We've, we've got to wait on the Lord. We've got to learn from the lesson of Jacob and wrestle with God. Praise the Lord that he invites us to wrestle with him. I mean, it's like my father when I was a, a toddler. He'd let me wrestle with him, and sometimes I would win. He let me win. I had no power over him, but he made me, oh, you got me. I'm down. And he'd hug me. That's the Lord. He, let, he invites us to wrestle with him. What are we in his sight? What is man that you are mindful of him? And yet the Lord is so mindful of us. He loves us, as Paul will say here in this passage. And he, he wants us to wrestle. And he wants us to win. And he wants us to know that he's on our side and that he has gone before us and that nothing can stand against us. We are more than conquerors in him. He wants us to be built up in our faith. And yet, all we have time for is, Lord, help me, and we, we run off. Instead of being present in his presence and being still with him. And so, in our prayer life, are we learning that balance to give worship and to make our petitions, petitions known and then to be silent and hear from his word and then to bring others into that. Lord, I pray for my neighbor. Lord, I pray for my friend. Lord, I, I pray for my son, my daughter. They have asked me to pray for them and I'm praying for others, not just myself. I think if we learn to make our prayer life into this engagement with Almighty God, we might learn to be less self-absorbed. Oh, we know that our Father knows the things that we have need of before we even ask, and He calls us to ask Him. So there's no shame in that. But I think there is some shame if our prayer life is only self-serving. I'm not sure we can call it a, a healthy prayer life if it's only on us. If we shine the light on, on the Lord first, I think then we'll see ourself in, our, in the proper context. And then we'll be quick to think of others. So let us learn from Paul here. Brethren, pray for us. We know what you're going through. We know what you need. I've written this letter because you're anxious about some things about the second coming. I've written this letter to comfort you and to help you because I've heard from you. I know what you need. But don't forget us. We've got some problems too. We have some trials to endure. We have some decisions to make. And so pray for us. What does he pray for? That the word of the Lord, Paul's an evangelist, he's an apostle, he's planting churches, that the word may have free course. That wherever we go with the word, that it wouldn't be bound and rejected, but it would have free course wherever we go. That the word of the Lord might be glorified the way it was glorified in your midst, in establishing a church, might it be glorified elsewhere? Might other churches be established? And pray for us that, verse 2, we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. They have faced unreasonable people. They, they have been afflicted by wicked men. 
Jason dragged out of his house and beaten within an inch of his life. And Paul admits, hey, not everybody's got faith. Not, not everybody's here to worship the Lord Jesus Christ and bask in his glory. The world, the world has no place for the true Lord of glory. Not all have faith. Not all have come to faith. Not all profess faith. And isn't that true today? As, as much as the gospel has been, has permeated the world, as much as the gospel has gone to the four winds, as much as the scriptures have been translated in I don't know how many languages, yet not all have faith. Not all of your neighbors down the street have faith. Uh, people aren't clamoring. I don't know if anybody wants to go look to get in here. I don't know if there's a line outside. Hey, is, is the church open today? Not everybody's trying to get in. Not all have faith. We live in a dark world. And we need to be aware that other people are engaged in that warfare as well. Just as we are going through our trials, so are others. We need to get our eyes off of ourselves and see what other people are going through. Now, the Lord uses our trials. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, I want to give comfort to you with the comfort that I have received from the Lord. I was first comforted. I, and he lists so many awful things that he endured and suffered. I found the comfort of God. And now I want to comfort you with the same comfort he gave me. So as, as difficult as life can be to us, as, as, as cruel and unforgiving as some of our life experiences can be, what you go through, what you go through, the comfort that you receive from the Lord as you go through the difficulties of life as a Christian, one day there will be somebody that you can comfort, that you can empathize with. Say, I've been there. I know what you're feeling. I know what you're going through. And I'm going to be praying for you. The Lord was with me and he will be with you. The Lord comforted me in the darkness. He held on to me and he's going to hold on to you. Who wants to hear comforting words from somebody who has no idea what, a, what difficulty you're going through? You know, a child may mean well, but he can hardly speak to an adult. Say, oh, I know what you're going through. No, you're a child. What do you know? But somebody that when they look at you in the eye, when they put their hand on your shoulder and they speak from their experience and they speak from great wisdom God has given to them and you can see in their eyes that the Lord has been with them and the testimony of their eyes is that the Lord will be with you. What a wonderful blessing it is to think about the Lord Jesus Christ who came down to become a human man and to go through and live a life of shame and scandal and to die a death of shame and scandal, to, to really suffer. And we read, he can empathize with us. We have a high priest who can sympathize and empathize with us. What a blessing that is. Of all the religions in the world, there is only one where we can by faith look into the eyes of God and see a man who has suffered, who really does know us. He knows our frame. And he ever lives to intercede for you and to pray for me. This is our God. What an incredible God that we serve. And so, the Lord, verse 5, is faithful. The Lord will establish you. The Lord will guard you 
from the evil one. What wonderful words of encouragement. The Lord speaks to these people. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful. Now, there are many... Many who have professed Christ in our day who are leaving the church, who are leaving Christ, who are abandoning the faith. And so often we hear it's because of maybe evil in the world or I prayed and the Lord didn't hear me or sometimes hypocrisy in the church or whatever it might be. They leave because they don't believe the Lord's faithful. They leave because they do not believe in the faithfulness of God. And they have some story how the Lord wasn't faithful. I prayed and he wasn't faithful. I suffered and he wasn't faithful. If we are expecting the almighty God of the universe, the creator of all things, the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if we are imagining him to pop out of Aladdin's bottle like a genie and entertain us like the Robin Williams genie in the Disney cartoon and to do a jig and dance around. Your wish is my command. What do you want? That is the kind of heretical theology that will lead you to forsake the Lord. And that's so often the problem. The Lord didn't behave as I wanted him to. The Bible doesn't say the things that I think it should say. And sometimes the Bible says things that I think it should not say. I can't believe in this God. I am forsaking Jesus because of these things. He's not faithful. God's not faithful. It's because they don't know the true and the living God. They want to serve a God after their own likeness, after their own image. They seek an idol. It's natural man. That's, that's what we do. We want to worship things that we create. We don't like the idea of standing in the presence of the living God and being answerable to him rather than him being answerable to us. We don't like the idea that we are in the hands of a sovereign God and he can do with us what he will. We have long since forsaken the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who said, we know the Lord can deliver us, but whether he does or not, we will not bow down to your idols. What an interesting thing. How interesting. We know he can, but we're not sure that he will. But whether he does or not makes no difference. We worship him. We are in his hands. Our breath is in his grasp. And he may do with us what he chooses to do, what he ordains to do, what he wills to do, what he sees fit to do. Oh, I don't like that. No, I want the Robin Williams genie to pop out and do what I want him to do. That's not the God of the Bible. That's not the God whom we serve. And you will find the true and the living God to be faithful. You'll find him to be faithful. The genie that you worship in blasphemy, you may not find that God to be faithful. This God after your own image. This God that is beneath you. The God that you hold in your palm. You may find him to be quite inadequate. And as you project that image upon the church, you may say, I'm leaving the church. I'm forsaking the faith. But if you worship the awesome God of Scripture, you will find him to be faithful because you'll understand he always does what's right. And that doesn't mean he's going to give you what you want. But it means he'll be glorified in your life. And as a Christian, as a believer, that's your ultimate desire. God be glorified through me. Whatever that means. And that's why the true Christians could go to the flames, to the fires, to the persecutions, to the courts, to the lions. That's why true Christians could lay down their lives. Because whether, whether he does spare me or not, it doesn't matter. He can, 
But I'm in his hands and I want to bring glory to him. How does he want to use my life? It's up to him. Let him do it. I will bring glory. And that God will always be faithful. That's the God you'll meet. Not necessarily who spares you from the flame, but he'll meet you in the flame. He may not spare you from the flood, but like Noah, he'll be with you through the flood. He didn't spare his son from the cross, nor did he spare many Christians who also went to crosses. But he was with them. And great is the reward of God's people who serve him, who testify of him, who give witness to him. See, when we put this world as having greater weight and glory than heaven, we're missing the whole picture. If our goal and our aim is to make it to those gates and to be met by Christ who welcomes us in and says, well done, my good and faithful what? Servant. But this world, we don't want to serve nobody. Don't tell me what to do. But that's not Christian faith. And that's not how you're going to see the faithfulness of God. Enter into the joy of your Lord because you have been good and faithful as a servant. This is the God of the scriptures. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God who is faithful. This is the God who will establish you and guard you from the evil one so that you can overcome trial and temptation. So that you can endure to the end no matter what comes your way. So that you can be a faithful witness at the end of your life as you were at the beginning. The Lord will be faithful to you. He will establish you. He will guard you. But you've got to be serving and worshiping the true and living God to experience these kinds of blessings. So let us conclude in verse 5. Now may the Lord direct your hearts right into the love of God and right into the patience of his son, Jesus Christ.